Stories and representations of peculiar-looking entities with large heads have been documented in various cultures around the world. Many of these beings were attributed with profound wisdom and mystical powers. Might these accounts actually be evidence of ancient alien visitations? Join us on The Fifth Kind for this episode of Ancient Civilizations, courtesy of Gaia, as we embark on a journey to uncover the origins of humanity, unveil astonishing discoveries, and explore our relationship with beings from the stars. Approximately 150 miles from the North Korean border lies the Chinese province of Jilin. It is here at an ancient burial site known as Hutamuga that researchers excavated 25 human skeletons dating back to between 5,000 and 12,000 years ago. The researchers were intrigued with their findings. These skulls of long dead individuals were elongated far beyond what is considered normal for average Homo sapiens. They also represented some of the oldest known examples of intentionally reshaping the bones in the human head to form this conical shape. The skulls found at, at Hatamunga, China are interesting because it, this is the first archeological site where they can judge just how long that practice had, had been going on. So some of the Hatamunga skulls dated as far back as 12,000 years ago, um, all the way up to 5,000 years ago. And so that spanned a 7,000 year period. And of course, when this happens, if you look at these individuals, they're gonna look strikingly different to everybody else. And these particular elongated heads date between 5,000 years ago all the way back to 12,000 years ago. And this is quite incredible because this shows that this process was going on at this early date. And this is at the very end of the last ice age. So what are these elongated heads? Why are they, why did they do this? You know, what do we know about this process? Which it must be pointed out is not unique to China. It's something that has gone on all over the world, in the Americas, uh, in the Eurasian continent, and in Africa. It's there everywhere. The origin of the dragon uh, emperors and the dragon people of China goes back again to about 8,500 BC, which is around the time period we're talking about here of this group of gods that survived the catastrophic flood and they arrived in specific hotspots around the world to kickstart civilization because it's always been suggested how did humans spontaneously discover civilization all at once, all around the world at the same time. So in 8,500 BC in China, we have the establishment of the dragon people or the serpent people as they're also called. And they were the two gods that basically had the group of seven other gods with whom they, were, uh, they brought the civilization to that part of the world. And they were described as very tall, long-headed, and it was their genetic bloodline that eventually becomes the dragon bloodline of the dragon emperors, which we know so much about. When we look at the historic records throughout Egypt and the highlands of central China and the monasteries of Tibet, as well as Mesoamerica and into Peru, what we find is that in ancient times, the beings with the elongated heads had very, very mystical powers. They were able to do things that typical humans could not. They were able to heal very quickly and heal the bodies of other people. They were able to understand uh, time in a very different way and see into the future and see into the past. And they were able to access information in ways 
that the average person appeared uh, could not do easily. If these elongated headed beings had mystical powers and abilities beyond the human species, could these strange skulls come from a completely different species on this planet? People with elongated skulls literally inhabited the entire planet, and no matter where you go on the planet, you will find remnants of elongated skulls or people that used to have elongated skulls. And a lot of evidence has been left behind that they traveled and circumnavigated the entire planet. They may have even been interplanetary. If this is true, could these elongated headed beings have come from the stars to give us knowledge? Another location provides more evidence. Malta, the three island archipelago in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It was here in the heart of these islands that these ancient people built the world's only known prehistoric subterranean temple, the Halsaflini Hypogeum. Within the lower chambers of the temple's necropolis, archaeologist Themistocles Zamet discovered thousands of skeletal remains during the early 1900s, their skulls elongated. The origin of these remains has never been determined. Only recently have these skulls undergone thorough scientific study. This is what makes it so unique, is the fact that you have these above-ground temples and you have a surrogate temple, which is its mirror image under the ground. It's unique in the world. And one of them was called the Hypogeum of Hal Safliani. And it was unique because when he started digging the inside of these 33 chambers on three levels, that's a hell of a lot of digging that was done, he found uh, something like 11,000 bodies in there, skeletons, uh, they'd have all been thrown in there very unceremoniously as though a massive tidal wave had taken over the island, which is exactly what happened. So he found all these bodies in there, and much to his amazement, a lot of them, I mean, there's over a thousand of them, were elongated skulls. And they're unusual. Uh, they, part of the fossa medium was missing, and also the sagittal satchel was also not there, as you'd find that little crack that's in the human skull. So something was different about these skulls, and it was realized that they represented an elite group, people who were different to the many other thousands of skulls. So who were these elites? Almost certainly they were the people in charge of the engineering projects that were going on on the island of Malta itself. And most assuredly, they had a different genetic background. But who were they and where did they come from? Could the elongated heads found in Malta give more evidence that the elongated heads were not only a different species, but maybe not even from this planet? This is where context becomes so important. Because if we look only at the skulls, we may never be able to solve the mystery but what the context of the people in the area tell us through their written records, through the artifacts, through the oral traditions, is that humans have always had a relationship with the cosmos. We have a family in the stars, and those that have come to us throughout history, various times in history, in times of need, when the humankind faced some of the greatest challenges and crises of war and climate in the past, famine. It is these beings with the elongated skulls that came and brought food such as quinoa to the people of the Andes. They brought wisdom of, of peace. They brought the ability to heal when diseases ravaged throughout these populations. And they all associate these extraordinary experiences with our family from the stars. If these beings did come from the stars, why did they come to Earth? When you analyze and look at some of these ancient texts, you'd start to discover that there's a the potential for an ancient galactic war that occurred in the Pleiades star cluster. And you had the Lyrians and the Syrians, and some of the depictions of them, they had elongated skulls. But either way, when you look at the record of people coming from other places to Earth, they seem to have elongated skulls, or the ancient people at least have depicted them as having these large elongated skulls. This isn't the first planet that this race has visited. These interdimensional uh, beings, they guide, often they guide the different planets and they bring in a, no a lot of knowledge. They are the knowledge keepers. 
these beings and they they have such a mass consciousness and they have a mass amount of knowledge that's beyond time that's infinite and they travel from planet to planet bringing this information and instilling it into the consciousness of any new planet that there is within specific solar systems if these beings were installing a new consciousness could there be remnants of them also in ancient Egypt, where many secrets of the gods and their power are carved into the walls of temples? The most famous elongated heads depicted throughout Egyptian history is a pharaoh of Egypt, Akhenaten, and his queen Nefertiti, and later, King Tut. I'm really intrigued by the elongated skulls that we find throughout history and depictions of beings with elongated skulls. In particular, I'm fascinated by Akhenaten and his children. Akhenaten is considered the heretic king in ancient Egypt, about 1400 BC. He's originally portrayed as a normal looking human being, but then suddenly the Egyptians started portraying him with what is clearly an elongated skull. And his children have elongated skulls. And it fascinates me to wonder, well, why did they suddenly start doing that? What is the ultimate meaning of that? Egyptologists dismiss it as some kind of a genetic condition that he suffered from that was passed on to his children. But I'm not so sure about that. It, it, for me, the answer comes from looking at the metaphysics that, that Akhenaten introduced. He introduced monotheism to the world. He fired the whole pantheon of ancient Egyptian gods and introduced the worship of the Aten, which he called the disc. And people, especially Egyptologists, say that Akhenaten worshiped the sun and the disc represented the sun. But Akhenaten said no, that the Aten symbolized or represented the light that illuminated the sun. Now think about that. That is a giant leap in consciousness that he's introducing. And he passed this teaching on to his children as well. Is there a correspondence between this giant leap in consciousness that he introduced and perhaps a, a heightened or a, a greater cranial capacity that he might have actually possessed and his children could have possessed. We're told by researchers of elongated skulls that the cranial capacity could be two and a half times that of an ordinary human being. Just think of what you could do consciousness-wise if you have a cranial capacity two and a half times what you have right now. And what if Akhenaten indeed had this cranial capacity, and he's introducing this super advanced metaphysics that actually changed the world. If these beings came to Earth to help the human population, is it possible their species could be linked to the human lineage at all? There is yet one more place in the world that holds a high concentration of elongated heads, and thanks to the dry desert location, the remains of the elongated heads have not been destroyed. Paracas, a desert peninsula located within the Pisco province of the southern coast of Peru. It is here where Peruvian archaeologist Julio Teo made an amazing discovery in 1928, an elaborate burial site containing tombs containing hundreds of ancient remains. Teo and fellow archaeologists at the time were amazed to learn these bodies possessed the largest elongated skulls found anywhere in the world and have come to be known as the Paracas skulls. In total, Teo found more than 300 of these elongated skulls, some of which date back around 3,000 years. Here's where the mystery begins. Because when we look at the physical skulls that we find in southern Peru, in places like Paracas, for example, what we find is that these skulls do not look like typical human skulls before they are deformed. Researcher Jack Carey points to some of the skulls discovered and shows that they are completely different from any other human skull. Paracas skulls are interesting because they're missing the sagittal suture and they have like one parietal plate. They seem to all express uh, genetic um, features that we don't see in normal humans. So the difference between the fossa major found in the one skulls is genetic, and it has to do with the type of ridge that's running through the top plate of the skull and, and almost makes it flatter. Uh, the Paraca skulls uh, were missing the sagittal suture, which is where you could, could connect the two parietal plates of, of the human skull. 
So in either case, those are genetic traits. They're not caused by ritual head binding. In 2018, several Paracas skulls received DNA testing from geneticist William Brown and scientist Nassim Haramain. Carbon dating was performed on the skulls upon arrival, and ancient DNA extraction was performed with the UCLA Center for Genomic and Bioinformatics Lab. By early 2019, they started analyzing the whole genome. We were able to receive samples from two skulls, elongated skulls, uh, from the, the Paracas region in Peru. They were amazingly well-preserved. Uh, so the, they had hair that was still present. They had soft tissues that were still present. And from my initial estimation, they looked like perhaps 400 years old at a max. When we did radiocarbon dating of them, they came out at 2,000 plus years old, uh, 2,200 years old for one, 2,400 years before present. We performed uh, analysis on the uh, skull volume, uh, the size of the skulls as compared to uh, humans. Um, the skulls were uh, had a larger volume than uh, human skulls. Uh, the sutures, where the two plates of a, a cranium, the cranial skull come together, uh, were different uh, in the elongated skulls. We have preliminary results from the testing we've done, and it appears to have some anomalies uh, that are very interesting. Uh, certainly, uh, being in contact with these skulls and seeing them and doing even just a, a general analysis of them is definitely remarkable. Some of the anomalies that we're finding in the testing is making us think that they could be different species, at least, than the uh, Homo sapiens sapien. The genetic testing is ongoing. But the first results shows a large amount of gene variation relative to the 1,000 human reference genome, which indicates either non-random changes in the DNA or a high degree of genetic divergence from Homo sapiens. But the latest results are even more fascinating. Analysis was done with a John Hopkins deep sequencing genomics core, and it shows that surprisingly, there are no alignment or matches to the human reference genome. William Brown explains what they discovered and why it possibly connects an ancient lineage. We've traced this interesting lineage uh, and anomalous results for the mother's side of these uh, two remains, of the, these elongated skulls. We traced the mitochondrial genome of these two elongated skulls to the, the haplogroup that most closely compares to the uh, mitochondrial DNA of the two elongated skulls is in the Black Sea region of Central Asia. Uh, this particular haplogroup is most strongly represented in this region around the Black Sea. It's very interesting because in that region, you find elongated skulls. It's very uh, unusual because in South America, you very rarely or never find that particular mitochondrial haplotype. Uh, but these elongated skulls, that's where they mapped to. We can say that the mother has a human mitochondrial genome, uh, but even that is almost borderline because if you were to randomly sample any two people, um, they would have about 20 to 26 changes in the DNA sequence against the human reference genome. These skulls, the mitochondrial genome from them, had upwards of 50 single nucleotide variants. So more than double the amount you normally see in the human population anywhere. So the, the mitochondrial DNA, uh, the mother side, is not closely related to any extant human populations either. If DNA sequencing of these ancient beings found anomalies relating to the mother, 
were investigations into the father's Y chromosome as equally anomalous. What you have is a Y chromosome that is not matching to the human reference genome Y chromosome, suggesting that the father was not homo sapien. Uh, and if that was the case, it would go a long way in explaining why we detected such a high degree of variation in the rest of the genome. Because this variation coming from a not entirely homo sapien father. Are the anomalies present in the DNA tests reflective of another species of humanoid? Or is it possible that some kind of genetic tampering has taken place within this ancient civilization? If it's a kind of mutation that you don't naturally see, that means that it's suggestive that the changes were directed by an intelligent agent. I could produce that kind of ratio of changes uh, by directly engineering or influencing the uh, genome of an organism. These results obtained from the Paracas skulls are an astounding discovery, yet they are not unique. In 2017, Gaia led the charge of an analysis and testing of several mummified bodies recovered in Peru. Maria, the name given to a female humanoid with an elongated skull, was found in this same Paracas region. After testing and DNA sequencing, it was determined that Maria, too, did not match any known human genome on the planet. The DNA analysis for Maria had a 20% matching uh, homology to the human reference genome. That's what we saw with the Y chromosome for the elongated skulls. Uh, you know, maybe the father uh, looked more like Maria. You know, that would be in agreement with the similarity between only 20% matches up with the human reference genome, just like what was seen with Maria. If this is true, could there be a connection with Maria and the other elongated heads? Matthias Di Stefano, who claims the ability to recall past lives via a connection to the Akashic records, remembers that Maria looks like a species from Sirius, but from a different part than the other elongated heads. The being that uh, I've seen you've, you, you have found in, in Paracas, in Peru, um, like many of the skulls that are there in Ica and all that region, um, they uh, usually came from the south of the world that I remember. Uh, in the south, the people were smaller, tiny compared to the uh, tallest that we were in the center and the north of the world. And um, they also had less fingers. So uh, for sure, the being that uh, was discovered um, was from the south of Ludok. And, uh, for, and for sure, when I've been in Ica, in Peru, and I've seen the skulls, I could, I could, I could tell that there were mostly humans trying to imitate them, but there were two of them that uh, they were from Ludok. They, I, not only by seeing the skull, but also by feeling it. The way in which I remember them is because I used to be one of them, and I remember how it was to be one of them since I was a kid. Um, I remember them from a planet that we used to call Gludok. And there were three main different races of our people. We were, um, the, my race was like two meters and a half uh, high. And there were other ones that were smaller. And, but the main characteristic was that we had three brains. Uh, two to balance the reality in the third dimensional worlds and the other one uh, to connect with the uh, realities um, beyond the third dimension, like the fourth and fifth dimension. The, the brain that we had allowed us to vibrate the information. So we were not much people 
that used to talk, uh, not talkative people at all. This took us to be one of the species from Sirius, uh, or close by Sirius, that went to every one of the planets that we're trying to evolve, that were in the process of evolution, and we were the ones seeding like the information, like the seeders of the of the projects that would become those worlds. So this is why some people in this planet used to call these species like gods uh, that came from the skies, other ones like the masters, other ones like the architects, uh, because we came here to, to teach. Could these architects have come to teach not only from Sirius, but from other star systems? Is it possible there is a link between all of these locations and the elongated skulls that have been found? All the pyramids in the world are aligned and they work for different kind of constellations. If you see the pyramids of China, the pyramids of Egypt and the pyramids of Peru, what you will find is that the Earth is reflecting the portals of Pleiades, Orion, and Sirius. If you see the sky, you will find that if you see the three stars of Orion's portal, at your left, you will have the stars of Sirius. At your right, you will find the stars of Pleiades. So when you see this, this structure and you print it into the earth, you will find China pyramids, Egypt pyramids, and Peruvian pyramids. So the whole planet can hold the frequency of the biggest portal toward the spiritual self in China, towards the biggest portal of every dimension in Egypt, and then in Peru, the order of the being and the order of the Confederation. I knew that my people would go and come constantly to this planet to make the settlements, to make the, uh, the download of the information uh, through pyramids mainly. Uh, for us, that kind of architecture represented the seats, represented the, the, the seats of uh, all the dimensions together. So this is why uh, this species used to be all along this planet, because for us this planet was an opportunity uh, like a greenhouse where we could put all the seeds together. Were beings from the Sirius star system and other star systems an ancient progenitor race that helped to seed and guide humanity? Is it possible these beings have been deities worshipped by ancient civilizations all over the world. The desire for people of the old world to ritualistically bind the skulls of their young may point to this possibility. Ongoing research into anomalous DNA sampled from elongated skulls excavated from ancient sites the world over continues to this day suggesting there could have been intermingling of Homo sapiens sapiens and these beings. This exciting research may one day reveal humanity's origins to be far more complex and challenging than our current understanding. Could these elongated skulls provide some answers to humanity's ongoing search for our origins on this planet? Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind. We trust you enjoyed this episode of Ancient Civilizations, courtesy of Gaia.com. Follow the links in the description to explore more from the series, along with thousands of original documentaries and programs.